Good morning, everybody. I do want to encourage you. It is a sweet time as we come together at noon uh, on Mondays for Jesus Hour. Uh, and I just have the privilege of coming in and um, sitting in it. And I'll even bring some of my work with me just to sit in it with the presence of God. Because the presence of God helps us with the work that God's called us to do. Amen? Really, really does. Presence of God. Now, stirred as we're worshiping the Lord this morning uh, by the lyrics, by the words, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Anybody been there this week? Don't lie, we're at church. Come on, anybody been there this week? Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Because that's who you are. You're a way maker. I don't know where you're at, what you're seeing, what you're feeling, but I know who God is. And he's a God that makes a way for his people. Uh, I love the, the, even the, the, the words that they added today. That He's a chain breaker, a, a uh, body healer, a past redeemer. Anybody besides me have some pasts that need to be redeemed? Well, that is who God is. That's the work that he is in. That's what he is all about. And we have been in a series in Galatians, but before we jump into the word of God today, I just want to pray a prayer. I was stirred again by the worship and reminded of two prayers that Paul prayed in the book of Ephesians. And the first one is found in Ephesians 1.17. If you have your Bibles, you can go there. I'm just going to pray it. And then the other one's in Ephesians 3. Starting in verse 15, actually, he says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith, speaking to that church at Ephesus, your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. And I just, I am thankful, God, for this church. I'm thankful for the great work that you're doing here. I'm thankful that for, as Pastor Jose said, the generosity. I'm thankful, Lord, that as I was in my office this morning, I'm thankful for hearing laughter outside as people were volunteering as, as greeters. That the joy of the Spirit is in this place. I'm thankful, God. Thankful for the faith. And God, I, uh, I'm not going to stop giving thanks, remembering this church in my prayers and ask that we remember this church in our prayers and, and that we keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may he give us the Holy Spirit and wisdom and revelation so that we can know him better. God, that's our desire this morning. Our end goal is not uh, to sing songs. Our end goal is not to hear a message. Our end goal is to meet and encounter you. Our goal, we want to leave here knowing you better. So would you open the eyes of our heart so that we can know you better? He goes on and says, I pray the eyes of your heart will be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you. Lord, uh, there's some this morning that need some hope, that need fresh hope. So, God, may you open up our eyes to see the hope that we have in you. We want to know that hope to which you've called us and the riches of your glorious inheritance in your people. And your incomparably great power for us who believe that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand. That power, God, may we know that power, that same mighty strength. Anybody feeling weak this uh, week? Anybody feeling weak besides me? Feeling weak? We have the power, the same power that Jesus used to raise, G uh, that God used to raise Jesus from the dead. We have that power, God, and may we sense that power. Let's jump over to Ephesians 3, starting in verse 14. He starts praying again. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom uh, we all, as a family of God uh, in heaven, derive our name. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, thank you, God, that you are not a God of, in poverty. But out of your glorious riches, would you strengthen us with power through your spirit in our inner being so that Christ might dwell in our hearts through faith. And I'm praying that we would be rooted and established in love, not in works, not in our self-perception, not in the values of the world around us, but that we would be rooted and established in love, and that we have may, may have power together with all of your people to grasp how high, how wide, how long, and how deep is the love of Christ. I'm asking again, Lord, we need a greater measure, a greater revelation of how high your love is for us, how deep your love is for us, how wide your love is for us. And how long your love is for us. 
and this love does surpass knowledge, may we be filled to the measure of the fullness of God, the full stature of God. Lord, we just acknowledge you're able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. Anybody believe that? Let's just pray that together. God, you are able to do, out loud, you are able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. According to your power, that's at work within us. Even me. Even my family. Thank you, God, that to you be glory in your church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. And Spirit of God, we ask that you disciple us in the word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I don't know about y'all, but I've been enjoying uh, this series on the book of Galatians. You know, and we've talked about over and over that Galatians is really about unity for the people of God, for the whole people of God, every tribe and every nation, Jews and Gentiles. And uh, the context of the book is some people came, some uh, believers, Messianic believers came from Jerusalem to Galatia, which is now we know as southern Turkey, and came to some of those churches and they tried to add to the gospel by saying that uh, faith in the faithfulness of Christ plus circumcision equals salvation. And that's not true. Um, that's not true. We're going to look at that here in a little bit. And we're going to look uh, this morning specifically at three things. There are three pastoral issues that Paul addresses here in Galatians 5. He's addressing, uh, number one, in verse, uh, chapter 5, verses 2 through 6, a deceptive gospel. A deceptive gospel. And that deceptive gospel is what I just said. These Jewish believers were saying that uh, faith in the faithfulness of Christ plus circumcision equals salvation. I think we have a slide to show this, maybe. Yep, there it is, right there. You know, and, and he is, has a pastoral concern, and he is coming in hot and strong saying, this is not salvation. This is not true. You know, uh, second thing he, he addresses is divisive people, verses 7 through 12. He's warning about these divisive agitators, and he uh, starts communicating about them in a non-rated PG-13 way. And we'll look at that here in a second. It'll be fun. You know, and the last thing that he addresses is destructive actions. Destructive actions that create division in the body of Christ. And we're going to look at all three of these this morning, but as we, as we start... You know, uh, a big part of this body, the, the, his greatest concern, what he spends most of the time with in this chapter, is division in the body of Christ and the acts of the flesh that lead to division. You know, a, a lot of times we, we can think about what, what's the biggest problem with the church? You know, what's the biggest problem? Is the, is the music too loud or it's not loud enough? The preaching too short, too long? We need more of the Spirit? No, we need more of the Word. We need, you know, uh, is it okay? I went to a church, I was a part of a movement that, that half that movement was called the anti-movement. They believed that you could not have a kitchen in the church building because there's no kitchen in any church buildings in the Bible. They believe you couldn't have Sunday school because the Bible didn't say have Sunday school. And so there are splits over these things. Crazy things. Yeah, you know, I heard about um, one church divided, was divided because literally this church had been around for 100 years, the Holy Creek Baptist Church in Landover, uh, Massachusetts, Maryland. Um, been around for 100 years, walking in unity, fellowship, mission, and ministry. But they ended up dividing over what side of the podium the piano should be on after 100 years. Some churches divide over, you know, if communion should be served from front to back or from back to front. You know, uh, just the craziest things that cause church division. I read a story this week about a man who was stranded alone uh, on an island for a number of years. And before long, some people some located him and came ashore to rescue him. But before they talked him off the island, he wanted to show them around. He wanted to show them all that he had created and built. And he said, come, come let me show you the house that I made uh, from just the material here on this d desert island. They go, they look at his house, and he said, come on, let me show you a little bit more of the town. And here was my little store where I kept all the goods and supplies. And uh, right here is the church that I built. And they're like, wow, you built a church? He said, yeah, absolutely, I built the church. And uh, they, then someone said, well, what's that building over there? And he said, well, that's the church I used to go to. <laughs> you know, it's, we live in a world where there's lots of twos. 
You know, it's part of the American way. Two cars, two kids, a dog, a half a dozen churches that we attend. And it's not necessarily a bad thing when we transition from one church to another. Because there are times where God would have someone move to be a part of another church's vision. To take our gifts, our abilities, our resources, and use them to serve another body of believers. God does that. But too often, the cause of church problems is selfishness, pride, unforgiveness, a love of one's own opinions, a mentality that the church exists to meet my needs and prevails, and and we become disgruntled when we're not having our needs met, our perceived needs met, and we divide, and there is disunity for wrong reasons. And disunity grieves the heart of God. And brings dishonor to his name. Just as those of us who are parents. We know that when there's disunity in our house. If our kids aren't getting along. It breaks our heart. And there's nothing that more pleasurable. Than to see our kids love one another well. Right? Nothing more pleasurable. So I want us to get into the word of God this morning. And I want to look at eventually. We're going to look at why is unity so important. You know, uh, uh, Christian community is important. Christianity is a means of community through Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, no Christian community uh, can exist. Whether, it, you know, and, and this Christian community happens, it could happen briefly. It could happen a single encounter. It could happen through daily fellowship. But it happens through Jesus Christ. When two or more are gathered, he is there. We experience his presence. You know, I don't know about you, but I even thinking about that prayer from Ephesians 3, you know, that, that when we pray together, when two are, I pray better when I'm praying with someone else. And I'm not diminishing the value of my time alone with God, but just the, I don't know, the intensity, the faith rises up when I'm not alone. And Jesus said, whenever two or more are gathered, he's there. There's more than two here this morning. I wonder what seat he's sitting in. I hope he's right here. And he is, with all of us and for all of us. You know, that's, that's who he is. That's what he's doing. And, and we want to be a part of his work because unity paints a picture of who he is. And so let's look at these concerns that Paul has in, in Galatians 5. Galatians 5, I'm going to start with verse 2. I agree with uh, Jaden that, that even though, I'm going to read verse 1 because it's important, but it's really, a, it, I think, a kind of closure to chapter 4. But he says, It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. And so here he goes. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised, he's obligated to obey the whole law. You are not trying to be justified by the law because you've been, if you are, if you're trying to be justified by the law, you've been alienated from Christ and you've fallen from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness which we hope. For in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself in love. And so that's a big statement. So Paul is saying, faith in the faithfulness of Christ plus circumcision uh, doesn't just lead to, uh, it doesn't lead to salvation, it leads to alienation from Christ. And when we let legalism enter into our hearts and our mind and motivate us to perform, we're moving ourselves away from the grace of Christ. The law, the law and, and just all the little religious things that we do, they have no value. He said that. Circumcision has no value. The law has no value. What counts is faith, you trusting in the faith of the faithfulness of the work that Jesus did. And that is good news. Uh, can you imagine, I think we have a emoji up here, maybe? Gabe, do we have, well, can you imagine what the facial expressions would have been of the men who were part of the Galatians church who got circumcised the day before Paul's letter showed up? I mean, I would be crying, you know, and I would be so mad. You know, but Paul is going after something here. He's going after the value and the importance of the work that Jesus did for us. And it's not about the work we do for him. 
but now he empowers us to, with his spirit, by his spirit, to do some stuff with him, and that's pretty cool. So he says, the thing that matters is not circumcision, it's not the law, is what counts is faith expressing itself through love. We're going to look at that here a little bit more here in a second, but that's a big theme of this chapter. He said, you're running a good race in verse 7. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? There is a little pun there when he said, who cut in on you? Uh, it was very deliberate. For real. That, that kind of per- persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little, a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. And I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Family of God, brothers and sisters, uh, am I still preaching circumcision? Uh, Why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. For uh, for, as for those agitators, I wish they would go, this is rated R, so if you don't want your kids to hear something rated R, plug their ears. He says, as for those agitators, I wish they would go the whole way and emasculate themselves. So this is a pastor who's passionate for his people. And there are some divisive voices coming in who are adding adding a deceptive gospel and they're dividing the people of God. And he is mad. He takes this, these people who are being divisive, very serious. Because you've got to realize, the church in Galatia, they're meeting at different house churches all around. And as they're reading this letter, some of those divisive people are in the room. And everyone knows who they are. And Paul is pretty boldly saying, I wish, they're, since they're trying to give you this false, deceptive gospel, they're being divisive. I wish they'd go the whole way and just emasculate themselves. Because if you try to live with Jesus plus the law, you are not going to be fruitful because it doesn't work. And part of what he was saying, you know, they, they think they know everything, but when they're emasculated, they lose their manliness, they lose their humanity. And they're placed in that culture, in that world, as less than human. And he is going after divisiveness. We're going to talk about why here in a second. Let's continue. Uh, He says here in verse 17, he says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh, but rather serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour one another, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So he says, you're called to freedom. But that freedom is not to, you know, we are saved by grace through believing in the faith of the faithfulness of Christ. But that freedom doesn't enable us to live, to be free to live a sinful life. And the reason we're not free to live a sinful life is because sin destroys us. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But we're free, we're empowered to live a free life. What the law could not do, the law couldn't empower me to walk in freedom. The law couldn't empower me to worship one God and one God only. The law couldn't empower me to honor my parents. The law couldn't empower me to not commit adultery. The law couldn't uh, empower me to not be coveted, coveted, covetousness, to live with covet and conceit and envy. It's only by the Spirit of God that we walk in freedom from the sin that so easily entangles us. So the Spirit of God is a big deal. And that's what he's saying. And the Spirit enables us. And again, the same theme. He says, earlier he says, faith that expresses itself in love. Now he's saying you're called, and the freedom is for you to serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law that these people are trying to add in on you, the entire law is actually fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the one thing. And you know what? It's interesting to me that the second greatest commandment, which actually the first and second, I think, go together. Because Jesus said, and the second is like it. The first one is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know what? I think that's a very important command. And this is why. It's impossible. It is impossible to love people well. It is impossible to prefer them. It is impossible to see how they're made in the image of God in a way that's bigger than our opinion about somebody else that would want to minimize their value. It's impossible. But when we have the Spirit of God, we are enabled to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Let me ask you a question. 
What do your neighbors think about you? Are you good neighbors? Like a good neighbor? State Farmer's there. Are you a good neighbor? If not, you need more of the Holy Spirit to enable you to love your neighbors, to love the people around you and next to you. And so he continues, verse 16, he says, Walk by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with one another, so, you are not, so that you are not to do whatever you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So this is really, really simple. What Paul's saying is we're going to be led by the flesh. Uh, the Greek word there is sarx, and it literally means like our, uh, refers to the sinful state, a sinful nature that we have crucified, but sometimes it gets reawakened, right? Anybody know what I mean when we live by the flesh? It's easy to live by the flesh when we're in a traffic jam. It's easy to live by a, in the flesh when we're talking to our wife about our finances and our bills. It's easy to live in the flesh when we're not happy with our work scenario. And he's saying you're going to be led either by the flesh or you're going to be led by the spirit. But these two things are always in contradiction to each other. You can't do both. They contradict one another. And he's saying so walk by the spirit. If you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. And now he goes into these destructive acts. These destructive acts that, that uh, are destroying the body of Christ. Verse 13 through 18. I'm sorry. No, I just read that. 19 through 21. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft and hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, and orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he goes on. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, uh, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And so he's comparing. These are the acts of the flesh. These are the fruits of the Spirit. And now remember the context here. He's not talking to individuals about like a new legalism of you got to do these things and you got to don't do these things. He's saying that when you live by the Spirit... There's going to be fruit that comes out of your life. And I want, you, I want us to understand this. The fruits of the Spirit are not emotions for individuals to understand. They're actions that we, ways that we treat one another as we're empowered by the Spirit of God. Actions that lead to us building up the body of Christ so that we can be the people who reflect who God is. But then we walk, if we walk in the flesh, and check this out. One, one commentator would say eight of the 13 or 15 of these are, um, are obviously destructive of community. I would say that 100% of these are destructive of community. I'm going to read them. I'm going to read them from the Passion Translation. Uh, if you wonder what my favorite translation is, it's about all of them. I am blessed and enriched by all of them. So he says, these are the acts of the flesh. Uh, Sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, impurity, pornography, chasing after things instead of God, which is idolatry, Uh, manipulating others, hatred of those who get in your way, (laughs) stupid, senseless arguments, resentment when others are favored, temper tantrums or fits of rage, only thinking of yourself, being in love with your opinions, Factions, being envious of the blessing of others, murder, uncontrolled addictions, and wild parties. And all of these are acts of the flesh that destroy community. Now, you know, some would say, okay, well, what about lustful thoughts, impurity, pornography, sexual immorality? Well, sexual immorality is practicing any form of sexuality outside of the context that God created it for. And the, create, the context that God created sexuality for is covenant marriage between a male and a female, a husband and a wife. Anything, any form of sexuality outside of that, I would add pornography, uh, impurity, lustful thoughts. It's destructive because of this. If I am living in 
uh, sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, just looking at pornography, I am seeing divine image bearers as, you know, just nothing. As objects. Not as human beings. Not as daughters of the Most High God or sons of the Most High God. And that destroys covenant. That destroys community. If we're married, or even if we're, if we're married, it does because it distances us from our spouses. And we don't experience what God made us for. If we're not married, it is we're taking on habits that we're going to lead, that's going to lead into our marriage with us. If we don't deal with it before. But look at all of these other things. I mean, you know, uh, manipulating others. This is a big deal. You know, there's a thing called triangulation in the psychological world. And when triangulation happens, one anxious person voices their, their anxiety, their discomfort, and another person, probably not that healthy, bites onto their anxiety and triangulates them from whomever the first person is in angst with. Does that make sense? And we manipulate others to get what we want. Uh, you know, dumb arguments, resentment when others are favored, uh, only thinking about ourselves, being in love with our opinions, all of these things destroy community. All of them. And then let's look at the fr fruits of the Spirit. Well, before that, you know, the implications of, we, we really need to get this because the implications that Paul points to here, if we're walking in the acts of the flesh and not keeping in step with the Holy Spirit, and we do all of those actions, it destroys community. And he says three things. He says, if you live this way, if you're led by the flesh, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. You're not going to be a part of the new creation. Uh, earlier, he, he said, I think it's about verse 15, he says, if you keep biting and devouring one another by the acts of the flesh, you're going to destroy one another. So if we're walking in the flesh and these actions, we're eventually going to destroy one another. I had a friend in high school who was bitten by a spider, and the spider had some kind of infectious thing, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know what it was, in, in it, and even though they killed the spider, that, that, that the poison that got in him from that spider started uh, destroying his skin, deteriorating his skin, and he had to have several surgeries just to get, cut it out. And, and beloved, when we are walking in the acts of the flesh, when we're being led by the flesh, we are destroying the body of Christ. And that's a big, big deal. In my marriage, if I'm walking in the acts of the flesh, I am tearing down my bride. And the implication of that is my kids are going to see it and experience it. So he says, if you keep on biting and devouring one another by these acts of the flesh, you're going to destroy each other. The last thing he says in the very last verse, he says, uh, don't be arrogant or conceited, provoking and envying one another, because this diminishes the value of others. When we're arrogant, and we're envious. We're not seeing how every single one in here is created in the image of God. I want everyone to look around right now. And I want you to look around with the mindset of creation. You are, you are created in the image of God. You have value. Even if you're not a Christ follower yet, you are still made in the image of God. And think about the person in your life right now that it's the hardest for you to see as someone who's created in the image of God. The person in your life right now that you would really love to practice almost all of these acts of the flesh upon because you'd like to see them devoured and destroyed. That's where the rubber meets the road. The works of the flesh come from this deep, dark place within us uh, when, we're, when we're enslaved to the power of sin, death, and idols. So the definition of sin and these, these destructive acts is it's missing the mark. It's Greek word hamartia. But here's how we do it. By saying yes to the self... And know to what God wants. The way that Paul said it here in Galatians 5 is, is you can't do whatever you want. If you do whatever you want, you're living out the acts of the flesh. You can't do that. Saying yes to self and no to God. An implication of sin, Stanley Grin says, that, that the implication of sin is the destruction of community. Now think about that. Sin is not just me offending God. It is me offending God. But when I sin, take any of those acts of the flesh. When I do any of them, if I'm divisive. If I'm deceptive, if I'm selfish, I'm destroying the body of Christ. My sin actions, you know, it's, it's, we, we can have this uh, individualistic mindset from the world that we live in that, hey, my sin doesn't hurt anybody else. Remind us of the story of Achan in Joshua 7. 
where his sin led to the destruction of his whole family. Sin is destructive. It's a big deal. That's why we got to hit this. So the acts of the flesh, we are created to walk in the fruits of the Spirit because the acts of the flesh blow up the bridge that was intended for the church to experience new creation. See this picture? We're experienced. God has made a bridge so that we can see who he is by interacting with his people. But we walk in the acts of the flesh, we're blowing that bridge up, and people can't see who God is and be a part of his people and the new creation. So the fruits of the Spirit, again, they're not just emotions. They're Spirit-empowered actions shared with others that build up the church and reveal the character and nature and beauty of God. I love the Passion Translation uh, because it supplies verbs to all of these virtues. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all its varied expressions, affection for others, joy that overflows with others, exuberance about life, peace that's experienced relationally, serenity, patience that endures. We develop a willingness to stick with imperfect people, kindness in action toward others, sweetness uh, a life full of virtue, goodness, expressed relationally. Faith that prevails for one another. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments and gentleness of heart with others. Not needing to force our way in life by the strength of the spirit. But able to marshal and direct our energies wisely for the sake of others. Never set the law above these qualities for they are meant to be limitless. And so he starts with love. And actually love, it, it, all of these are attributes of love. And that when we're spirit-filled people, we walk in love. It affects how we see one another. It affects how we think about one another. It affects how we relate to each other. And it's a big deal because the world is watching the witness of our relationships with each other. The world is watching you know, before I got married, uh, I was excited about getting married. I was excited about all the benefits that come with being married. Um, you know, I was excited about feeling like I had a greater sense of value because I'm married. And I, I had a lot of vision for getting married. But I think the holiest vision that I've had about being married is what if one day I have the honor of pushing Brian around in a wheelchair and she has a diaper on? Because that is a picture of who Jesus is for us. That, that, that is the fruits of the Spirit. And, and I think that we, would, we should be more inspired to ask Holy Spirit, God, show us what it looks like to relate to one another in this way, in these Spirit-filled actions with you that deliberately build up the body of Christ so the world can see something beautiful and say, I want in on that. I want in on that. And the whole deal here with Galatians 5 is that Paul's saying the Messiah people, last week we talked about resurrection people, live differently. We don't live like the world. There's no room for the flesh. We're called to live in a, in a life where we're, our lives are marked by the fruits of the Spirit. And here's something about fruits. Another word, the Greek word also means Harvest. The fruits of the Spirit that starts with a seed being planted. And the seed that's been planted is the Holy Spirit being implanted into my life. The Holy Spirit being imparted into my life, into your life. And it's not my role to make the Holy Spirit do whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do. But however, in a gardening aspect or gardening culture, I do want to pay attention to what the seed's doing to what the seed might need. The Apostle Paul says, stir up the Spirit of God within you. How do you stir it up? By praying in the Spirit. By asking daily, God, would you fill me again? You know, God plants the Holy Spirit within us, and then we with him, we want to cultivate the life of the Spirit. We want to guard the life of the Spirit. We want to keep those things that's going to hinder the Spirit from coming more out of us. We want to stop, we don't want to let those things in. Those things that's going to influence us to walk in the flesh. Are you with me? So God, Paul gives us this language. 
that it doesn't just happen on its own. It's got to be cultivated carefully and guarded. We'll talk about how to do that here in a second. But we can't do it by ourselves. The Spirit of God is with us, and he's in us. So how do we walk this out? What is the remedy to destructive disunity? Paul, Paul talks of the Spirit five times in chapter 5. He says, walk by the Spirit, be led by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, and you'll bear the fruits of the Spirit. That's the remedy to not walk into the acts of the flesh. And so what do I need? I need the Spirit of God. First thing I want to do, I want to discern, is this a flesh action coming out of me? Is there a flat, fleshy attitude coming out of me? We, we talk about this at our house all the time, that you know, we're, you're, being a, you're being a flesh ball. And when we're in a mature place, we're going to say, sorry, guys, I was just a flesh ball. And so the first thing that we need is the Holy Spirit to live in us and understand this is relational. Walk by the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. You know, thinking about like in your, in your rooms, I mean, your houses and some of your roommates and some of your roommates probably don't have the gift of washing the dishes. Or something, you know. I'm one of those roommates. Uh, and it'd be easy to, to create these mindsets toward each other where we just get frustrated and want to distance ourselves from one another. Right, Holly? Right, Phoebe? They're roommates. They love each other greatly. But, you know, but these acts of the flesh, they show up and we're not paying attention. And so, number one, we say, Spirit of God, help me discern right now. Is this the, am I being led by the Spirit or am I being led by the flesh? And if you have siblings, that's a great testing field to, to, to acknowledge, to learn. Am I walking by the spirit or am I walking by the flesh? And being a part of a church is a great testing field to see am I walking by the spirit or am I walking by the flesh? Galatians 5.24, the last verse, or one of the last verses in the chapter, it says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh, flesh with its passions and desires. So number one, we want to discern when am I walking by the flesh and when am I walking by the spirit? And the way to do that is say, spirit of God. Am I being led by the flesh? Am I being led by the spirit? When it comes up relationally, part of how we're led by the spirit, we see somebody that we want to be a flesh ball to, we just stop. Say, okay, Holy Spirit, I'm seeing this in them. What do you see? What do you see? And what do you want me to do? How can I partner with you? To call out of them what you see in them. So I can call out of them what you see. So he says crucify by the flesh. And then he says keep in step with the spirit. Live by the spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. And he is with us all the time. And the a work that the Holy Spirit wants to do. Is enable us to love people in ways that we never could apart from his help. I love Bill Johnson's quote that, that honor is celebrating who someone is without stumbling over who they're not. And calling things that are not into their lives, even when they're not happening yet. Believe in the best. In closing, Dwight Moody once stated that I've never yet known the Spirit of God to work where the Lord's people were divided. The Lord's presence was among his people because they walked in his wisdom and they took time and effort to reconcile their differences. However, if they had gone uh, to war with one another, they would have incurred God's wrath and been destroyed. Dwayne Elmer tells us that the destruction of unity is the destruction of something that God has made holy. Any activity contributing to disunity also contributes to, to the veiling of God's glory. I'll say that again. Any activity that contributes to disunity contributes to veiling God's glory. If you want to hide the glory of God and risk his presence depart departing from our worship, then allow conflict to continue. If, however, you desire to abide in his presence, then you must always seek peace and work toward the resolution of problems among brothers and sisters. Unity is a big deal. The last verse, John 17. Starting in verse 20, Paul, now Paul Jesus, prays this. He just got done praying for his disciples. 
He says, my prayer is not for them alone, but I'm praying also for those who will believe in me through their message. You know who he's praying for? Us. We're the ones who believe in him because of their message passed down. Who believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I'm in you, may they also be in us. Why? So that the world may believe that you have sent me. He then says, I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me. So that they may be brought so that they may be brought to complete unity. What happens when that happens? Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Why is unity a big deal? Because our unity, our loving one another, our walking by the power of the Spirit and bearing the fruit of the Spirit in our relationships reveal to the world a God that loves them, a God that's good, a God that works on behalf of others' highest good all the time. When they see our generosity, when they see the way, this is a big, it's not, it's not in the fruits of the Spirit, but it is the fruit of the Spirit. When they see forgiveness happening, refusing to hold on resentment and moving into the place of believing the best and calling out the best. Unity is important. So I would say we need to pray for unity. We need to pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we can walk in the fruits of the Spirit. We need to be as disgusted by those who create this unity as much as Paul was. One way that we can help this unity happen is stop listening to divisive voices. Don't listen. In our house, when one of the kids come to us with an offense about another kid, the first thing we say is, have you talked to them first? Don't listen. And may the Spirit of God that rose Jesus from the dead be among us so that we can love one another the way that he loves us. He, Jesus said that. He said, may they be one so that the world can know and so that the world can know that you love the world just as much as you love me. Our relationships reveal that love of God. <laughs> and we need his presence to help us. I want to invite everyone to stand up and the prayer team to come down. And if you have never been filled with the Holy Spirit and you realize you really need the Holy Spirit we want to invite you to come down and ask someone to pray for you that you'd be filled with the Holy Spirit and when the Spirit of God fills us sometimes some things happen sometimes nothing happens I when I was filled with the Holy Spirit I didn't feel anything but something changed immediately on the inside of me something changed sometimes you feel it intensely but we can't walk in the fruits of the Spirit without being filled with the Holy Spirit. Number two, Ephesians 5 tells us that we're to be continually filled with the Spirit. Why? Because when we live missionally and life is happening, the Spirit gets drained off our lives. So we need to be refilled with the Holy Spirit. If you are stuck in some of the actions of the flesh that destroy unity, that destroy community in the body of Christ, I want to encourage you. The Spirit of God's convicting you to repent and to confess your sin, he will enable you to walk out of here free. And the last thing is, whoever the top one to three people that you are carrying an offense toward, I would encourage you to not talk to someone else about them, talk to the Lord about them. Ask him, how do you feel about them? And then do whatever he tells you to do. If you have these needs or any other needs, if you are not a follower of Jesus and you want to be one, we would love to pray for you today. We need more people up here to prayer uh, team more of the prayer team please come up and spirit of God would you just have your full way God this is a big deal because Baton Rouge needs you as Virgin said you've never moved powerfully upon a people where there's division and divisiveness because it veils your glory God would you search my heart to show me where there's divisive acts of the flesh within me, divisive attitudes. I know that's where I got lots of those. God, would you reveal them to me so that I can crucify them, so that I can confess them and repent of them and walk in the fruits of the Spirit. 
Guys, this is the moment of our time together where God likes to show off. So if you have any needs, just encourage you to come and get prayer. And when prayer changes things. Don't come here as you were and leave as you were. Come and get changed by the presence of God. I love you. More than that, Jesus loves you. And he wants to do a great work in our lives this morning. Have your way with us, Lord.